So one of the things I've been working on is, uh, is machine learning. Um, so this is, uh, the idea here is that we have uh, these uh, quasar surveys, uh, which find a bunch of things in these very noisy spectra. So this is a, a picture here of a noisy spectrum. Uh, the blue line uh, uh, observations are from the spectrograph, and the red line is the best fit, uh, including one of these features. So we are looking for things that look like this. The dotted red line is what it would look like if the feature wasn't here, and the solid red line is what it would look like if it is. And these are damp Lyman alpha absorbers, so these are objects that come from very, uh, very dense, very neutral clouds of gas, kind of small galaxies, you should think of them as. Um, the uh, reason that we're interested in them so why do you care about these things? So there are a few reasons you care. If you're a galaxy person, you care because these are galaxies. These are galaxies that you're seeing that are too faint to be seen from their starlight, and you see them from their absorption signature in gas instead. Uh, if you're a cosmologist, as I am, uh, you care about them because they're a foreground. They mess up a bunch of things you would like to be doing with these surveys. They mess up uh, your understanding of dark energy, and they mess up your neutrino mass. So like any foreground, the way you get rid of them is you find them and you clean them out. If you are a machine learning person, they are an opportunity to apply mach uh, cool machine learning. This is uh, arguably the secret reason why I'm involved in this project, because I wanted to understand how machine learning worked. And so I figured, well, you know, I know something about uh, you know, small galaxies and, and neutral gas. Maybe I could do some machine learning with this. Uh, the really nice thing about this is I was able to get some money from Amazon.com uh, to pay for me to do this. This is fantastic. You know, normally you pay Amazon money and they give you things. So now what I've done is uh, I have given things to Amazon, and they have given me money in exchange, which is wonderful. Um, it wasn't a lot of money, but it, it was some money. OK, so, so what are we doing here? So this is the state of the art for finding things in quasar spectra. Uh, this, is, this is what I understand observers to, to do some of the time. Uh, so you take a spectrum. This is an example here. And it's, it's kind of noisy, and you're looking for a feature in it. So you're looking for a feature like the one that I showed you before. I have made it easier for you by putting this red line, which is uh, kind of a guess at what the spectrum would look like if there was no noise and no absorption. And so all of you, every single one of you, even the people who do condensed matter, are now going to look at this and figure out where the absorption was. Has everyone done this? And you're all going to get this right, because you're smart human beings, OK? Everyone done it? Yeah? It's there. Who got it right? Every single one of you, including the people who are too shy to put up their hands. Right, OK, so you did that. And that took you maybe a second, right? So the next thing you have to do is that because this is a large survey, you have to do this 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 7 times. OK, so now, now you are becoming a little bit less happy. You're, now you are thinking, why am I doing this tedious, repetitive task of looking at 10 to the 7 quasar spectra again and again and again and again? We have a solution to doing tedious and repetitive tasks. And that solution is to teach a computer to do it for us. So what we did uh, some years ago uh, was that we uh, taught uh, a computer a Gaussian process model for the quasar, so a machine learning model for the quasar, and then used that machine learning model to work out if there's something in the quasar other than the, the standard quasar model. So this is kind of a clever trick. So the part of the clever trick uh, that happened here is that you might normally expect us doing machine learning and looking for a thing to learn a model for the thing that we are looking for. We didn't do that. We learned a model for the background in the absence of the thing that we are looking for, and then used the very physical and you know, worked out from, from fundamental atomic physics model for the object uh, to distinguish between the model for the, the thing we're looking for it in and the, the thing we're looking for. Okay? So we have a learned model for the quasar based on a Gaussian process which I'm not going to explain because the last two or three colloquia uh, have uh, explained Gaussian processes multiple times. But broadly speaking, it is a Bayesian function interpolation. Um, you build this model for the quasar using machine learning. And then you apply a model selection criteria to work out if there is a DLA in the model. And the DLA has a couple of parameters that you estimate using uh, normal parameter estimation. So this, is, this worked really well. You know, we were able to take this, uh, this technique, uh, apply it, uh, work all these things out on a workstation in about a day, which definitely beat the previous method, which was to take a grad student in Paris and have them look at 10 to the 7 quasars in turn, and over the course of two or three years, work out whether or not there was this foreground uh, in the quasar spectrum or not. 
After they spent two or three years uh, doing their PhD, they decided to leave the field because they were a little depressed. Um, so this is an improvement in many ways, okay? Um, so uh, there are a couple of students who are working on this. Uh, so uh, Ming Feng, is Ming Feng here? There you are, right. This gentleman here is working partly on it and partly uh, with Gillian. Um, this guy uh, is working on extending this model to add uh, multiple absorbers in it. Uh, there's also this chap, Jacob Fauber, who's uh, a CS student in uh, the Bournes College of Engineering, who I don't believe is here. Okay, he is also working on extension to this model, and he is also uh, working partially with a professor in, in engineering. So, okay, so why do we need to care about multiple DLA? So this is my same spectrum again. So when I published the first paper on this, I assumed one DLA per spectrum. So I assumed there was gonna be one guy here. Why did I do this? So the reason I did this was that when I tried to add more, mod more DLAs to the spectrum, I found that it always uh, produced more of them. So I would, if I had detected a single DLA and I asked it, is there another one in the spectrum, it would always say yes. So this is a, a general issue with machine learning or indeed model selection in general, which is that if you have a model with way more parameters, it's often going to find it easier to fit your data than a model with fewer parameters, right? You have more freedom to fit your data. And this was what was happening. Uh, so it would find one DLA here, and it would say, hey, wait a minute. You know, this red line, this red line here with the absorber in, it doesn't quite go through the blue lines. You know, there's kind of noise here. So hey, what if this were not one object, but two objects pretty close together? Then I would get a better match, because I'd be matching to the noise a little bit better, okay? So this was a problem. So uh, like any good faculty, I said, okay, I have this problem that I cannot solve. I'm gonna find a graduate student and make them solve it for me. Uh, and I did this, uh, and Ming Feng solved the problem uh, by, uh, by virtue of hard work and looking at a lot of spectra. Um, and so this is what we have here. So this is uh, a spectrum down here. The red line, which hopefully you can see, uh, shows a dip here, a dip here, and a dip here. And these are three DLAs in the same spectrum. This happens maybe uh, 10 times in 100,000 spectra, so it's not a very common thing. Um, this, uh, this here is the um, posterior model selection for each DLA, and the bright orange bits show the most likely parts of the model. So there's one here, there's one here, and there's one here. The blue diamonds, those are the, the DLAs that we're detecting. The red circles are the DLAs that were detected by someone else's catalog. So you can see they match up extremely well. Uh, so this works very well. So thanks to Ming Feng uh, for using uh, a lot of hard effort uh, and fixing a number of bugs that he found in the implementation and improving the sampling for making this work. Um, so another thing we can do with this. Um, so what we've done here is we've not learned a model for the absorber, right? We've learned a model for the quasar. So Anything that we want to do with a quasar, we can also do with this model that we learned for it. So in particular, we might want to know what the redshift of the quasar is. So here is my red line. This red line is the model that I think the quasar should look like in the absence of noise and the absence of absorption. If I take this red line and I shift it a little bit this way, there's a big hump here, and it's gonna be here. If there's a big hump here, that doesn't look like a very good match, right? There's a hump here in the original quasar, there's no hump here in the, uh, in, in the shifted quasar. There's also a big peak over here, which matches a big peak in the, blue, in the blue spectrum. So if I shift this red line around, it is not going to match the, the blue line very well. So we can use the fact that we have this red line to work out what the redshift of the quasar is, which is essentially uh, you know, what is the, the shift between the red line and the blue line. So this we did. Uh, this is a project with Christian Shelton uh, and Jacob Fauber in, in CS. I should have a, project of a picture of Jacob here. I don't have a picture of Jacob, so I gave you a picture of Christian. Uh, you, know, you always want a picture of the grad student, but, but he doesn't have one for some reason. Uh, so you, you get a picture of, of the professor instead, okay? Um, how does this work? Okay, so this is an example of how well it works. This is the rest frame quasar spectrum. So this is the, the big peak that is telling you uh, what the redshift is. This here is the posterior probability of the quasar having a redshift. So these lines, they're pretty flat, and then there's a huge peak here. And this is the redshift that we think this quasar has uh, from visual inspection. So this might look like it's not, looking, like it's not working very well, okay? 
Why does this will look like it's not working very well? Because this is relatively flat, and this peak, which we think is the truth, is only a little bit larger than this flat thing. However, this is a log probability here. So on this axis, we have 2,000, 0, minus 2,000, minus 4,000. So what this is telling you is that uh, the likelihood that this quasar has this redshift of about 2.2 is e to the 2,000 times larger than the likelihood that it has a probability of about 3.2. So this is working very well. e to the 2,000 is a large number. Uh, as you can, uh, being physicists, you are able to, to deal with these things. Um, so uh, I've shown you here the, um, the, the quasar in the rest frame uh, at redshift 2.2. And you can see that, yes, there is a big peak at 1216, just like you would expect, and there's an absorber here. So this is working really, really nicely. So what we've done here is we've taken uh, our model for the quasar uh, that we estimate and we use to uh, detect DLAs, and we've been able to extend it to detect multiple DLAs and to detect the quasar redshift. And both these things are working really well. So thank you to the, the grad students who do all the work with us. Uh, yes. So this red dot is the redshift from the catalog. This is not our estimated redshift. Um, the redshifts from this catalog are notoriously kind of bad. Um, so they, you would expect them to fail catastrophically maybe a few percent of the time. Um, it looks like if you do this multiple times and then you compare it to the catalog redshifts, it looks like most of the error is just that the catalog redshift isn't quite working right now uh, by dint of a certain amount of effort. Um, okay, so that's, that's one thing I've been working on. Um, so I now want to do a little bit of a rundown of, of my group and the things that they're working on. Uh, so first up, I want to talk about uh, the great work that Phoebe's been doing. So Phoebe is my postdoc, is sitting right there. This is a picture of Phoebe. Um, so Phoebe has been working on uh, adding extra physics to cosmological simulations. Um, so one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is using cosmological simulations to measure the neutrino mass. Uh, so to do this, what you need to do is you need to build a simulation of the universe at a redshift of roughly three, you know, three or four billion years ago, uh, and compare it to the real observed universe at a redshift of roughly three. However, uh, the simulations we use to do this, while they ought to model all the important physics, they actually do not. Uh, they lack a model for the ionization, the heating uh, of the helium in the universe uh, due to ionization from quasars. Um, so this is the most important thing that happens to the universe at about redshift of about three. Uh, and this is not modeled very well. So what Phoebe has been doing, Phoebe turns out to be an expert on this particular process. So what she has been doing is she's been adding a, a model for this uh, to the simulations. So how does this work? So what you do is you take your simulation, you find all the black holes in the simulation. Around each black hole in the simulation, you add a bubble, and you keep adding bubbles in turn until the whole universe becomes reionized. Okay? So this is a little animation of the, pro of the process. Each blue star is a, a black hole, it's a quasar. Each red uh, circle is a bubble around the quasar uh, that's been heated. So you can see you start off with a few, you add a whole bunch more. Uh, you can see also that the, the blue stars are right uh, in, uh, in the middle uh, of the densest regions in the simulation, and then they kind of spread out. Um, so the first version of this, uh, this uh, movie that I had Phoebe make uh, had uh, gold stars uh, for the black holes rather than blue stars. And this was a wonderful picture, which was visually very striking. But it looked a little bit like those 80s propaganda videos of the rise of communism across Western Europe. <laughs> um, so I had to change it to be blue. Um, but this is, uh, this is quite a nice little thing, right? Because this is a major physical process uh, that has been unmodeled uh, in simulations for a number of years. And the idea is that by putting this into our simulations, firstly, we'll get much better constraints on the neutrino mass, because it turns out that the systematic uncertainty in the heating due to this process is the dominant uncertainty in, in measuring cosmological neutrino masses. Um, and secondly, we hope that it will have a bunch of other um, applications, um, in particular for galaxy formation uh, or for um, you know, uh, processes of working out how gas uh, gets in and out of galaxies. Okay. Any questions on this before I move on? Yes? Uh, so the simulation has a model for black holes already. So every time you get uh, a, a halo, uh, you know, a galactic halo of about the right mass to host a black hole, uh, you plonk a black hole in the middle, and then you follow its accretion uh, and its uh, growth through mergers. 
um, analyst, um, numerically in the simulation. So we're just piggybacking onto existing work. Okay, All right. okay so that's Phoebe. Um, so I also have a bunch of graduate students. Um, so is Martin here? Yes, Martin is here. So this is Martin Fernandez. Uh, he is doing a project on uh, cosmic strings. Um, so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to, uh, so cosmic strings are relics of the high energy universe. So the way you should think about them is imagine a large block of water which is solidifying into ice. Okay, you got that? When this water solidifies into ice, it doesn't solidify evenly. Uh, it undergoes a phase transition and there'll be cracks in the ice. The cosmic strings are the, uh, the equivalent in the universe of high energy phase transitions. So as the, the universe cools and it undergoes various phase transitions, there will be small defects in the structure of space. And these are what the cosmic strings are. So they're relics of a, a much earlier high energy time. You would expect to detect them uh, very, very occasionally. One of the ways we can detect them, perhaps, uh, is that they will move the structure in the universe around just a little bit. So the idea of this project is to, uh, to look at late time effects of cosmic strings passing through a volume of the universe and see whether we can thus put constraints on how many cosmic strings there were at the beginning. Uh, this is an excellent project. One of the reasons that this is an excellent project is that uh, Martin was able to win an NSF uh, fellowship from it. So congratulations to Martin, uh, who, who, uh, and also to all the other winners of the NSF fellowships in the department who are extremely excellent in all respects. Um, so okay, so this is, uh, this is a little movie uh, of how you would expect the cosmic string to affect, uh, affect structure. So these two things, let me start that again. <laughs> these two points are two particles. This is a cosmic string. The cosmic string comes past the two points. As, they, as it meets the edge, uh, the cosmic string removes a bit of space. Wacka, 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 wacka. Uh, because it removes a bit of space behind the two particles, they suddenly become much closer together, okay? So what the cosmic string is doing is it is cutting out a wedge of space-time behind the cosmic string uh, and moving them closer together. And we're going to use the fact that these particles are closer than they would otherwise have been uh, and thus gravitate to each other slightly more to detect the effect of the cosmic strings on structure. And this is uh, a project that uh, Yongu is involved in. Hi, Yongu. Um, and uh, we're all working together to do this. Uh, okay, so this is the effect. This is a plot of the effect of the cosmic strings on structure. So here I have a simulation without a cosmic string. Here I have a simulation with a cosmic string. Okay. So this guy, this has not come out very well on the projector. Can everyone roughly see the cosmic web in this, uh, in this slide? Okay. So these things here are over density. So each dot is a little galaxy. So the white dots are galaxies. This here is kind of the beginnings of the cosmic web kind of growing uh, very gradually here. This is what happens if you put a cosmic string through the simulation at the beginning. So because the particles will move closer together at a very high redshift, um, they start to collapse into a kind of line of things, right? So this is a filament structure. Um, it's more dominant at high redshift because you see a high redshift that there is much less else going on, okay? So at high redshift, you get this, this big filamentary structure. If you then evolve the simulation down to low redshift, you get something that looks like this. So now you get more structures that have evolved just from uh, the galaxies themselves nucleating together. It looks kind of like this. But you still get a larger, longer blob of galaxies uh, that have been stuck together kind of on this side. So this is what it looks like at redshift four. This is what it looks like today at redshift zero. So you have a long line of things at redshift four. You get extra structures growing around it by redshift zero, but there's still more structure uh, than you would expect if there hadn't been a cosmic string, okay? I believe this is uh, 60 megaparsecs, is that right? Yeah, 60 megaparsecs. So it's a relatively small box, but it's big enough. Um, right, so this is the effect. So what we're gonna do is we're going to run a few simulations with and without cosmic strings. We're gonna look at see if we can find differences between these two things. Uh, and using this, we're then going to compare to observations in the real universe and say, okay, does the real universe look like one which a cosmic string went through or does it not, okay? So this is how we do this. So what we do is we take our large box simulation and we try and find filamentary structures. 
So I, told, I showed you that the, the cosmic string seeds a filamentary structure at high redshift. So what we're going to do is we're going to look for, for filaments in the, uh, in the structure itself, in the, the distribution of galaxies. Um, this is what this movie is showing. Let me start this movie again. Yeah. OK, so this is, uh, each of these white dots is a different galaxy. Uh, we're going to find filaments in this, uh, this box of white dots by taking all the white dots, moving them towards local density ridges, um, and then identifying them as lines. So this is what this has happened. These yellow uh, lines are each galaxy moved towards a local density ridge. The red lines now are the uh, identification of the galaxies with a filament. And so we can count these red segments as they flash up on the screen. Can you see that, or is the projector completely ruining the movie? You can see that? Good. Maybe a little bit. OK, so you can count these red segments. And you can say, are there going to be more red segments with cosmic strings or without cosmic strings? We would hope that there will be more red segments with the cosmic strings, and thus we can use the number counts of these things to detect whether or not there's this high energy physics in the universe. Does that make sense? Yes. You must be putting into the simulations a certain structure function that some observable. Uh, yes. Right, so you're, you're asking uh, how do we know that this comes from cosmic strings and not from something else, I guess. Is that, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm just saying that the, the underlying structure that you start with, I don't know, are you, is this like, this is not informed by observations of the, the like primordial uh, structure is independent of um, that thing? So, uh, um, it is, to some extent, informed by observations, right? Because it's informed, it, it has to match the microwave background at high redshift. Um, so that's, that's most of what the information is coming from. The filaments from the cosmic strings um, are going to have a somewhat different distribution uh, to the filaments that you get from structure. Um, in particular, they're going to grow in a different way, right? So at high redshift, you're going to have a lot more, uh, the, the ratio of cosmic string structure at high redshift to low redshift is going to be different from the ratio of, of uh, normal uh, galactic structure, high redshift to low redshift. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. So in your simulation, you just put into a, you change the, uh, the density field, right? For the initial transition, you probably put a delta function. Right? That is exactly what we do, yes. Okay. Yeah. I believe we also change the velocity field. Um, any more questions on this? Um, OK, so uh, some of the things I've been doing, I've been working on quasar analysis with machine learning. Um, I've been working on simulating, or Phoebe's been working on simulating helium ionization. Um, we've been doing a project trying to detect cosmic strings. Um, my next uh, two grad students, so uh, Madi, is Madi here? Yes, there he is. Uh, so this gentleman, he's looking at uh, the metallicity of neutral gas. So this was kind of, uh, this was an interesting result from a few years ago, that if you look at the metallicity of neutral gas, uh, in the universe as a function of redshift, you find that it's roughly flat up to about redshift four and a half, and then it drops suddenly. So this is a little curious. So why is this? So the naive interpretation is that this maybe has something to do with reionization. So maybe, I was thinking, that's why I decided to work on this, maybe you have neutral gas uh, that has a you know, metallicity that evolves up to about redshift five, and then much more of the gas in the universe at much lower densities starts to become neutral, and the average metallicity, metallicity drops. OK, so I think maybe if we look at this in a simulation uh, in which reionization is not really included or is included at much higher res uh, redshift, we're going to see something that agrees really well and just continues going uh, to higher redshift. OK, so there's, there should be no drop uh, in the simulation uh, at redshift 5. It should just kind of keep going like your power law that you expect. Okay? And I knew very well that the simulations agreed reasonably well with the observations because I had looked at it before between redshift 2 and redshift 3. So imagine my surprise when Mardi uh, comes up with the results at redshift 5 and redshift 1 and shows that they don't really agree at all. So I had got kind of lucky before, because it turns out that the redshift that I'd looked at it before, at redshift 2 and redshift 3, this redshift agreed, and every other redshift did not agree, except for redshift 5, where I expected it to, to be completely discrepant. 
So this is an interesting result, right? This is a result that is the exact opposite uh, of what I expected it to be. So, what, so instead of a, a model where I expected that this would tell us something about reionization, that reionization was happening a little bit later than, than the simulation predicts, uh, this is telling us something about uh, the gas uh, at other redshifts, the gas at redshift 4 and at redshift 1, uh, which is probably saying something about the, uh, the star formation rate at redshift 4 or the star formation rate at redshift 1. So this was a little curious. This is a, a project that, that Marty has been working on. Um, other things, okay, so is Brian here? No, okay, Brian is not here. So Brian Scott has been working on making forecasts for UV satellites. Uh, so you can uh, observe UV photons from a bunch of satellites. You might want to know what galaxies they come from. Um, this is a project to correlate uh, the sources of UV photons uh, with uh, the optical sources. Uh, I also have an undergraduate, Thomas, is Thomas here? Thomas is at the back. So Thomas is an undergraduate who is going to do a PhD at Johns Hopkins, so congratulations to him. Uh, his project was to work out whether uh, counting objects with IGM tomography, which is uh, the subject of the colloquium from about two or three weeks ago that, that Drew Newman gave, uh, is this going to be useful for cosmology? And it turns out the answer is yes. So this is a forecast for Drew's uh, IGM tomography survey, um, which finds uh, basically analog analogies to galaxy clusters at redshift 2. Uh, and the constraints that complaints on useful cosmological parameters such as the density of matter in the universe. And you find that the constraints are not too terrible. So this is great. Okay. Um, so that was a quick overview of my group. Uh, I now want to give you an update uh, on this primordial black hole stuff. So this is, um, this is a paper that I wrote three years ago now. I want to preface this talk by saying that when I wrote this paper, this was kind of a crazy idea that I had over lunch. Right? This is something that I expected would, be, would not work and would be ruled out. And I'm kind of uh, amazed that I'm still giving talks about it three years later and that it's still something reasonably interesting. Um, so these are my collaborators. Uh, at the time, they were all at Johns Hopkins. And the question here is, did LIGO detect dark matter? So as you know, what LIGO detected was the merger of a bunch of 30 solar mass black holes. Okay. The question is, where do these black holes come from? Where, how do they form? Uh, so if they are dark matter, uh, then these are not black holes from, uh, from collapsing stars. These are black holes that formed in the early universe. So what happens is that if you had a whole bunch of material uh, close enough together that there was greater than a Schwarzschild mass within the horizon, it would spontaneously collapse and form a black hole. These are primordial black holes because they come from the early universe. These are a candidate for dark matter. Why are they a candidate for dark matter? Because dark matter is dark. Uh, black holes are dark. You know, do the math. This is a unique candidate for dark matter. Why is this a unique candidate for dark matter? Because it is uniquely impossible to test this in an accelerator. Right? These things are 30 solar masses. If you're going to get 30 solar masses of material in your accelerator, you're going to have to build a very remarkable accelerator. And if you were to do that and were able to form a primordial black hole, it would be very, very unwise to perform the experiment because you would quickly no longer have an accelerator or a planet to test it on, okay? So this is a, a unique black, uh, dark matter model for a number of reasons. Okay, so what we did in 2016, uh, essentially what our paper was, was an order of magnitude estimate uh, for the merger rate of primordial black holes, assuming that there's a whole bunch of primordial black holes out there and they make up a lot of the dark matter, an order of magnitude estimate for the merger rate of black holes to see whether it was comparable to LIGO. And I, I want to, to emphasize that when I had this idea, I strongly expected the answer would be no, right? that, that this, is, this is not going to work. So what did I do? You know, I thought, OK, let's check this. What did I do? I say, OK, let's assume that black holes are dark matter. Let's assume that all the things that we know about dark matter, because the, scale, uh, the physical scale associated with galaxies is substantially larger than the physical scale associated with the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole. So let's assume that everything we know about dark matter and how it clusters in galaxies is true and unchanged by the fact that dark matter is made up of black holes. Let's further assume that every now and again, black holes that are kind of swimming around in a halo pass relatively close to each other. And when they class close to each other, because they are black holes, they will radiate energy into gravitational waves. If they radiate enough energy in gravitational waves, they will become bound. They will form a binary. The binary will keep spinning around itself, will continue radiating energy into gravitational waves, and will eventually produce a gravitational wave merger, like the one detected by LIGO. Okay? So it turns out to be the case, uh, and it's, it's been known for a long time, that this, uh, this 
being bound by radiation of gravitational waves is the dominant process that cause, causes black holes um, uh, that are unbound to become bound. Okay, so this is, this is the, the dominant merger rate. Uh, this cross-section has been known since 1989. Uh, this is a very nice little simple equation. Um, so there are some order one factors uh, in the front. Uh, this is the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole, which is quite small. This is the relative velocity of two black holes uh, compared to the speed of light. So two things that I want to draw your attention to. Firstly, this is a negative power, right? So the two black holes to merge best should be moving relatively slowly next to each other. And this makes sense. If they have a low relative velocity, then it is easier for them to, to radiate energy and become bound, okay? The second thing uh, that I want you to know is that this uh, relative velocity of the black hole is naively going to be like the halo velocity dispersion. So you have a whole bunch of black holes in a halo. Uh, they're going to be uh, zipping around with some uh, velocity dispersion, which is roughly like the virial velocity of the halo. And this makes sense. If they were moving with a larger velocity, they would not be in the halo. If they were moving with a smaller velocity, they would be forming some kind of a subclump, okay? So what this means in total is that most of these mergers are going to be in very, very tiny halos, yeah? These are the things with the smallest velocity dispersion, so they're gonna be the things where the black holes have the smallest relative velocity, which means that they're going to be the black holes to find it easiest to merge, okay? Uh, it turns out that uh, the lower cutoff on the mass of the halo that can form black, that can have black hole mergers in is about 400 solar masses. So for 30 solar mass black holes, like the ones detected by LIGO, uh, this is roughly 12 or 13 black holes. Yeah. And the reason this is the cutoff is that at 13 solar mass black holes, yes, they are technically bound, but they have such a wide binary that there is no way they're gonna merge in a Hubble time. They're just gonna sit there rotating around each other extremely slowly. And over the course of 10 to 20 billion years, they will very, very slowly merge. But we're never going to see that because we don't sit around for 10 to 20 billion years to wait. Okay? The universe is not that old. Okay, so one nice thing about this model is that uh, the, slowest, the, uh, the slowest part of this process is the formation of the initial binary. As they get closer, they radiate more energy into gravitational waves faster and faster. And so once they have formed a binary, the binary will merge quickly compared to the time scale that it takes to form a binary in the first place. So this means we can make a good approximation that all the binaries form today and then merge instantaneously, okay? So what I am doing here is I'm working out uh, the, uh, the rate of black holes to be, uh, that are distributed as in dark matter halos today uh, to be passing close enough to each other to become bound, right? And I'm doing this at order of magnitude. Uh, to do this, I made a whole bunch of standard assumptions about the dark matter density. I'm not going to go into these, um, but you can look these up in the literature. They are you know, standard assumptions that we know from structure formation. Uh, the, the famous navarro frank white profile for the dark matter, um, a halo mass function forming like we know uh, galactic halos to form, uh, and some other thing that comes from some simulations. And what I get is this. So this is, this is my favorite. This is, this is the, the money plot of the, uh, of the paper. Um, so this is the mass of the host halo of the black hole binary. This is the merger rate uh, in each host halo per year per cubic gigaparsec. So imagine you had a gravitational wave experiment that was pointed at a single galaxy. This is the number of mergers it would see in that galaxy. So what we need to do to work out the total number of mergers seen by a gravitational wave experiment is take all these, uh, all these uh, halos and integrate them up and find the total area under the curve. And that will be the total number of mergers per year per cubic gigaparsec in the universe. And it so happens that uh, the initial LIGO runs had a range of about one gigaparsec. So you can take uh, this number, integrate it, and just drop the gigaparsec cubed and say we'd see about uh, two mergers per year. So I did this. Uh, I came up with this number, which was about two. And I looked at the merger rate estimated from the first LIGO event at the time, which was two to 53 year, uh, mergers per year per cubic gigaparsec. And I said, ah, you know, two lies between two and, two and 53. So this is great. This is good enough. I will publish this. We have agreement. Wonderful. Uh, so then what happens? So LIGO, of course, keeps switching on and, and you know, keeps taking data and keeps observing things. And after a while, it publishes another result with more detections and a much uh, improved estimation of the background. And then the merger rate for these types of black hole mergers shifts down just a little bit to be 0.5 to 12 per year per cubic gigaparsec. So this is, I, I want you to understand how wonderful this is for a theorist. 
I made a prediction here, and then the data moved around to match my prediction better. This is the best thing that can ever happen to you. Um, so, you know, this, I was very happy. And obviously, this means that this is right and, and that they, they detected uh, primordial black holes. Um, and, and I should get a Nobel Prize, please. Um, so, you know, this is, obviously, that's not true. Um, so this is, this is, I mean, I would love a Nobel Prize, but that's, that's not really true. Um, so this is not the point. The point is that what I've done here is I've made an order of magnitude estimate for the total number of mergers. And this number happened to be around one. Okay. There are many uncertainties in my order of magnitude estimate. Right? If, uh, if, I were to be, if I were to make small changes to my assumptions, I could get 10 out or I could get you know, a half out. But that's not the point. The point is that this number could have been 10 to the 10 or it could have been 10 to the minus 10. Right? A priori, there's no need to, to, uh, to predict that, these num that this number is roughly one and that matches more or less to the, uh, the, the observations by LIGO. So this was interesting and this continues to be interesting. Um, and it raises the question, you know, did LIGO detect dark matter? Uh, or did, did, uh, you know, are these black holes that are detected by LIGO really uh, the result of, of uh, stellar evolution? Or are they primordial? Do they come from the early universe? So since I published the paper, uh, there have been updates. Um, so let me give you these updates. Uh, so the first question that you might have, um, the first question that everyone has is, is this ruled out? You know, is there some other way of, of detecting these black holes? at 30 solar masses. Can you put constraints on the number density of black holes in the universe uh, by some other technique? Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, so there are many proposed ways of detecting primordial black holes. In my opinion, the gold standard and probably the only reliable way of detecting black holes uh, is this thing called microlensing. So this is a cartoon of microlensing. So this is a star. So let's say this is a star in the Milky Way or in the large Magellanic cloud. This is a relatively close star. This is a cartoon version of your telescope. This is a black hole. When the black hole passes in front of the star, gravitational lensing is going to make the star look a, bit, a little bit brighter. When the, the black hole passes away from the star, it's going to get dim again. So what you do is you take your telescope, you monitor 10 to the 4 stars in the Milky Way or the large Magellanic cloud, and you look for stars that, that become suddenly bright and then go dim. Uh, this uh, has been done for a number of years. Uh, it placed strong constraints on primordial black holes. Uh, however, at the time that I wrote this paper, these constraints stopped at about 20 solar masses. I mean, uh, you know, you can't ask for a, a, a better thing than this if you're a theorist, right? There's an experiment. It's really good, but it stopped just below the, 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 the place that you're interested in. Um, so this was great. Uh, why do they stop at 20 solar masses? They stop at 20 solar masses because of the length of a PhD. So it takes a certain amount of time for a black hole to pass in front of the star. And during that time, the black hole, the star's brightness doesn't change appreciably. So it brightens when the black hole passes in front of it, and it dims when the black hole moves away. Um, but while the black hole is just kind of sitting there, it doesn't really change that much. So the time scale for one of these things uh, to happen, given the number density of black holes of 30 solar masses in the Milky Way, which is known, if you have uh, uh, a black hole of around 20 solar masses, the time scale for one of these events to happen is about five to 10 years, which is the length of a PhD, okay? If you're very slow. Um, so for this reason, these surveys tend to run for about five to 10 years, and there, are, there were no constraints on heavier black holes. Since, this, uh, since I wrote the paper, um, someone come up with a better way of doing this. Um, this is uh, Zumala Kalegui and Seljak um, last year who wrote a paper called No Ligo Macho, which I am told is funny in Spanish. All you Spanish people, speakers in the audience, because this is LA, you can find that funny. Uh, I'm not going to explain the joke, because it's not appropriate uh, for a colloquium, but it's very funny. Um, what they did was they looked for distant supernovae. So they looked for supernovae that were substantially brighter than you would expect them to be at their redshift, um, and they didn't find any. So they were looking for supernovae that had been lensed by a black hole along the way from uh, Redshift 1 to us. And they didn't find any. And because of this, they placed constraints on the number density of primordial black holes to be less than about 30% of the dark matter. So this, uh, this rules out the full, uh, the full joyous completion of our model where it is every single part of the dark matter. It doesn't rule out, you know, this, that would have been nice, but yeah, I wasn't, I'm not 
hugely surprised, right? I mean, it, it would be great if the universe uh, gave us the solution to all problems all at once, but that, that seemed like somehow a little bit too much to ask for. Um, it did not rule out that uh, these primordial black holes could be 10% or 1% of the dark matter. So we're, we're now looking at a model where uh, the LIGO black holes could indeed be primordial, um, but the, there are not enough of these black holes to explain all the dark matter. They're just some fraction of it. Okay. Um, there will be a future telescope that is going to be ridiculously good at this. Uh, so the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope is a, a thing that's going to image the entire sky pretty much once every three days. So this is naturally extremely good for looking for transients. Stars becoming brighter because a black hole is going in front of them and then becoming dimmer again. This is a transient. Because it images the entire sky uh, 10 to the 3 times once every three days, it's going to see every single time a star becomes bright and every single time a star becomes dim again. Furthermore, because it's going to go for a long period of time and image every server, every star in the sky, it's going to be ridiculously good uh, for a reason that the earlier surveys couldn't, uh, couldn't quite work out. So this is, this is my background star. This is the sun. This is my telescope in June. This is my telescope in January. Okay. This is the black hole. So in June, I see an angle to the black hole, which makes the star brighter by a certain amount. In January, I see a slightly different angle between the black hole and the background star. So the background star will be made brighter by a slightly different amount. So by looking at a, doing a differential survey of the uh, magnification of the black hole at different times of the year, you can look for lensing, even if the lens is not moving very much. So it turns out that the, uh, when you do the numbers for this, you find that the forecast on the constraints of the PBH fraction is like 10 to the minus 4 of the total dark matter fraction. So this is going to rule out PBHs uh, to a ridiculous degree of accuracy. So once this thing switches on and, and finishes its 10-year survey, uh, you know, we will know how many primordial black holes there are in the galaxy. Uh, we'll know if there are any. Uh, we'll know, uh, you know uh, what they have for breakfast. We'll know what their masses are. We're going to know almost everything about them. So this is going to be an extremely powerful uh, uh, survey for this. Um, OK, so I didn't answer the question. Uh, so the question was, did LIGO detect dark matter? Right? Uh, you can split this into two sub-questions. The first sub-question is, are primordial black holes all the dark matter? And the answer to that is no. Primordial black holes are not all the dark matter because we have this lensing survey that says they have to be at most 30% of the dark matter. A second question is, are some of the black holes that are detected by LIGO merging primordial? So I didn't, you might think that I could answer this by computing how many black hole mergers uh, there should be given that only 30% of the dark matter is primordial black holes. I can't really do that because I had an order of magnitude estimate, right? If my estimate were good to the percent level, I could do that. But because it's good to a factor of two or a factor of 10, I would not trust any constraints that come out of it. So the way you do that is that you measure the mass function of the black holes from LIGO. So this is a, uh, a plot. That, this is a plot of the, am, am I out of time? Is that, <laughs> is that, is that my, I've got one slide left. No? Yeah? OK. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, this is a plot of the uh, mass function of black holes as, as LIGO might detect it. Uh, so the basic idea here is that if you have two populations of black holes, say one is the result of stellar evolution of supernovae, and one is, the, is a primordial population, this max function need not be smooth. So what I've plotted here is I've plotted uh, a Gaussian mass function from primordial black holes and uh, some uh, stellar IMF uh, power law mass function from uh, exploding stars. And you can see there's kind of a hump. So for this model, we were being kind of conservative, uh, and we assumed that you know, there was a subdominant uh, you know, po uh, population of primordial black holes, and it was just going to make a small difference to the, to the mass function. We said, okay, how many black holes do we need to, to, to constrain this? The nice thing about this piece of work is that it doesn't require any extra work, right? You're gathering these black hole mergers anyway. All you have to do is add them up. So, you know, this paper came out in 2017. Uh, the way it works is that you make a model for a cell of black holes, which is a power law RMF with an index of about, uh, a power law with an index of about minus two. Uh, the primordial black holes are Gaussian. Um, LIGO uh, is more efficient at detecting uh, black holes with a mass between 20 and, and 40 solar masses um, just because of their, the, the frequency range to which they're sensitive. Uh, so this means you tend to see more objects around uh, 30 to 40 solar masses. 
That was our forecast. This is what the LIGO uh, 01 uh, mass function looked like. It, it's not very much like the smooth power law model. It actually looks very much like a Gaussian peak uh, with maybe a small subpopulation uh, of, of uh, low mass binaries down here. Um, if, you, uh, if you try and fit a Gaussian population of black holes to the current LIGO data, uh, it fits very well and actually somewhat better than a, uh, a stellar IMF with a power law. And this is detailed in the latest LIGO paper. So this is kind of curious. You know, I kind of expected that at this point LIGO would have published its mass function and it would look like this and we would have constraints on there being a population of black holes and it would be largely ruled out. But this is not what happened. What happened was they published their mass function and it kind of agreed quite well with it being a, a Gaussian. Uh, so that's... Uh, that's a little bit curious. Um, you know, I don't want to go overboard with this, but uh, I think the answer to my question uh, is, are primordial black holes all the dark matter? No. Uh, are some of the LIGO mergers primordial rather than stellar? A solid maybe on that one, uh, when I expected the answer to be no. So I'm pretty pleased with this. Um, thank you very much for listening, and I'm sorry when a couple minutes over. Uh, I think you were first, yeah. Young Yu, I think you were first, yeah. Sorry, yes, R30 solar mass PBH for the dark matter, you're right, yes, sorry, yeah. That's absolutely right, yes, so uh, smaller mass primordial black holes of around Earth mass could still be all the dark matter and are still a completely valid dark matter candidate. Uh, and nothing we can do has been able to rule them out. So that's a shame. Oh, why do you think that the primordial black hole distribution is just so narrow in mass? Is that because it's been ruled out by other things? Um, because um, it's, not, uh, it's not guaranteed, but it's a good default assumption. Partly because, as you, as you kind of implied, there are strong constraints at lower masses um, and less strong constraints at higher masses. Uh, partly because um, the way these things are forming is that there's, uh, there's um, a certain amount of mass within the horizon, right? So you would have to have uh, the default models of this, the simplest model of this from inflation, which I personally like, even though many of the inflation people prefer more complicated models is to have some kind of feature in the inflationary power spectrum which tends to produce power on a specific given scale. And that naturally gives a narrow Gaussian uh, distribution. Um, so in my mind, I've always had this as a kind of default model. Um, I know that some of the inflationary theorists disagree with me uh, and think that, that a better model would be a, a broader uh, power law. Um, but it, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't make too much difference to the constraints, actually. Uh, so you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't know for certain, right, J just from the, the, the signal, but you can put a strong prior because you wouldn't expect there to be very many, you wouldn't expect there to be enough uh, non-primordial black holes to do significant amounts of lensing. Um, so there is a, a background uh, to the microlensing, a, somehow a, a, a flaw in the background to the microlensing, which is the number of stars that lens other stars. Um, but there are way more stars than there are black holes. And you, if you work out the number density of these lenses, it's actually somewhat lower than you would expect. And this, this makes sense because there's six times more dark matter than there are black holes, right? And the dark matter is much more spread out in the halo. So the, where you're looking, you're not looking, uh, you're not looking in a region where you expect there to be a lot of stars and a lot of black holes. You're looking kind of out in the halo where you expect there to be not very much. So it, it's, a, it's a prior argument. Yes, there are very stringent constraints from CMB. Uh, so our hope is that you've extracted all the information from the CMB already. So our hope is that the structural formation constraints will turn out to be more constraining or constraining in a way the CMB isn't. Um, 
We haven't run the numbers yet, so I don't know if this is going to turn out to be true. But uh, this is the hope. Yeah. Then your your dark matter, uh, the, the the black hole mass is 400 times the solar mass. Then you match them together, it's really all the ones, right? So then the, you know all the ones number of the stars become binary, become merges. Then they should they should match exactly. Okay, um, I mean. Uh, <laughs> I didn't think of that at the time, but yeah, sure, if you, if you like. Um, it turns out that it is order one, so I'm not going to disagree with you. <laughs> Maybe I should have expected it. 